Hi, it's Jeffrey from Ahead of the Curve. Today I had Corey Fitzgerald on with me from XR Studios Live. We had an incredible conversation about virtual production, extended reality, and the differences between an extended reality and virtual production workflows and working in a live environment today. It was an incredible conversation and you really should take a look. So check it out. Hello and welcome to another episode of Ahead of the Curve, everybody. I'm your host, Jeffrey Platt, and on the show today, I've got Corey Fitzgerald from XR Studio Live. Hey, Corey, how are you, man? Good, how are you? Awesome, thanks so much for being on the show. Really appreciate you having here. Before we get started, I just wanted to mention to you all that we have started a little Patreon thing called Be Our Hero. Um, it's just a little way of uh, mainly helping, maybe you guys helping us keep this thing afloat. So uh, we've got that going on. And we actually also, as of today, I opened a, a swag shop. So um, I've got some swag online. If you guys want to help support us, that would be really, really cool. So check that out as well. And Christmas is around the corner. We make some great Christmas presents. <laughs> but otherwise, Corey, how are you today? Uh, I'm doing well. I'm doing well. It's been uh, it's a pleasure. Thank you for having me again. Um, and uh, yeah, just kind of getting getting some things going here and, and moving, moving and grooving. Moving and grooving. Well, it's great mm -hmm. to have you back on the show. I know you know being on the panel a few weeks back was a really great experience. Had tremendous feedback on that, uh, and it's a real real joy to have you back again, kind of one on one, so we can kind of dig a little bit into what you've been doing and uh, you know the the birth of XR Studios. Sure. So do you want to kind of dive into that a little bit and give us a little kind of uh, overview of what XR Studios is and, and how it was created? Sure. I mean, I, I think just to jump even further back and not to, not to be redundant on anything else I said before, but the, I mean, we sort of came together as a group um, of people who have been working on live shows for a long time uh, and obviously traditional shows with audiences and venues and, you know, trucks and all that kind of stuff. Um, and showed up. Uh, we have been dabbling with some technology, some integrated stuff. Oh, can you Hello? Hey, yeah, we just kind of chopped up there oh. a little bit from Bluetooth. Oh. So you're still here. So sorry. Yeah, so audio sorry. chopped up a little bit. Uh, Okay, I will. I will keep going. If not, I'll take them out. Um, but yeah, we we had been you know working in traditional shows for a long time and saw this medium as an opportunity to sort of keep working and and develop it uh, from what had been you know sort of an ongoing science project and and trying these new technologies and connecting all these devices together and really utilizing that as a as a stepping stone into like well how do we make how do we turn this into a, a tool that we can build shows out of again. Um, and that's kind of where it all started. And we did, a, you know, starting with the Katy Perry kind of American Idol performance where we brought a bunch of ideas together and worked with her and her team and some existing assets and various different ways that that came about to create something that was like, well, this is a viable medium, right? This is something that we can do and create a show in a COVID-friendly environment or at least relatively safe uh, and, and use yeah, those- Minimal amount of creative, people. Exactly, like you use those, the, the, these creative tools that you know allow people to either work remotely or uh, with a skeleton crew and really kind of refine what that is, um, and then use the technology again as a tool. So we're, so we're, we're obviously pushing it to its limits. Um, and I think you know every time we've done a show, we've we've encountered new problems, new experiences, new good things, bad things, and, and worked with you know the various companies involved to kind of get them uh, like figuring these problems out so that we can do it. And I think ultimately what happened last week with the Billie Eilish live stream performance was sort of the culmination of a lot of that into the ability to do a, a truly live, you know, virtual performance with real performers in a virtual space. Um, so it was, oh, hi. <laughs> um, but the, uh, but yeah, that was, that's kind of, I mean, it's a, the, a lot of information in between, but the sort of trajectory has been, you know, we want to be able to, get people back to work and build shows again that are functional, if virtual, and and really pushing the boundaries of what the technology will do. You know, I, I often say it's kind of the modern day magic trick of being able to now do anything we want to do in this sort of 3D hologram, holodeck space. Um, but that the also requires- holodeck is real. Yeah. It's just a um, there. It's exactly. Uh, and it's just how do we, you know, now it's about, I think, pushing the creativity of what can we do with it, not just 
that it not just that it works or that it tracks or that it feels interactive, but like what are we actually doing? What is the show? And hopefully getting us back to a, a, a form of creative expression as opposed to you know what it, what can we do that's technically possible in the time we have, which is sort of always going to be the case. Absolutely. Uh, so. Talking about Billie Eilish and Katy Perry, um, how how many? When did you guys actually start and pull start to pull this together? Was this back in March? Did you guys, or were you exploring it before the pandemic even took place? Um, I mean, we'd known about the technology. Obviously, you know, JT and Scott um, had been working with this for much longer than I have. Certainly, I'm not claiming any kind of like history necessarily. Um, but as far as developing it into a tool to actually do like live performance space chosen, I think we sort of saw this as an opportunity to take that and run with it. Um, and that's kind of when it was like, well, now what is possible with this? Learning about how long does it take to rehearse these things? How long does it take to you know, actually shoot different scenes or we're doing edits or how many, how many shots do we need? Who's directing it? How many people do we really need in the room? Um, what happens if we want to do live audio? What happens if we want to bring in live uh, instruments? Like a whole bunch of things that we had to learn as we're doing this to kind of try and, and you know succeed and fail at what was going on. So, I mean, the, the, the process, I, I, it's been, feels like, I was just saying, it feels like 10 years ago now, but the, <laughs> the, I feel like they, they had about three weeks to build the content for the Katie thing. I think that we were in the studio probably realistically 10 days of setup and prep and, and working on it and then actually rehearsing it for about two and a half, three days and then you know, in the studio with her for about a day. So it, the, it was definitely a process which we've been able to sort of streamline a little bit since then to kind of condense what we know needs to get done, how we can organize the time better. Obviously, the technology is is light years ahead of where it was uh, eight months ago. Um, yeah. So able to, to sort of reliably use things that are, um, you know, basically standardized now. So all the problems that have been solved hopefully stay solved and we can just kind of keep pushing it forward. But as we've learned with any kind of time you change something, it breaks or changes the way other things work. And then every time you change a piece of content, potentially for a creative or a functional note, you can then damage or break some of the other things that are also working. So the process of getting a show, just like any other traditional show, but getting it across the finish line can be much more difficult than usual because you're dealing with something that's so new and somewhat unstable. I don't want to say it's like not working, but it's it can, it's so volatile. You can actually change something you didn't mean to, and then it, it causes a bunch of effects you weren't expecting. So um, it's, it's, like software, it's like software design. <laughs> you go it's, back. I mean, it, it's a hundred percent domino effect and screws up everything else down the road. Oh yeah, I and mean, I, I started back in in console development and R and D and testing and like any. You know, you, things you don't even expect to affect each other all of a sudden make playback impossible. Or, you know, the, the, the simplest things where you're just trying to fix a bug, all of a sudden it was there because of something else. And you, you really can't predict where it's going to go. So definitely seeing that as a, as a well, like, <laughs> making judgment calls on, is this worth trying to fix? Or are we OK with the way it is today? Because <laughs> we might break it enough to not have a thing tonight. So. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's it, again coming back from our our on site or show experience or design or direction or production producing whatever. Like, that's that's what we're sort of I think adding to this mix of like as a layer of things and people to help develop these shows, but also guide artists and creators into the right direction of saying this is this is possible. This version, this is the version we think is possible with what you want to do, or this is how much time we think we'll take to get what you need to do, and that's too much time. So, but maybe next month we could do the thing you want to do in a different way. So it, it's it's kind of overseeing that from a top level and working with all the different departments, um, which I think has also helped push this a lot further, a lot faster uh, than the technical side, which is also, again, accelerating at light speed because it has to. I mean, the, the, requirements of each one of these different shows is so different from each other. Um, and you're encountering, like I said, new experiences, new problems, uh, new requests, really, is more than anything else, is I want to be able to do something like this, but maybe more different, or maybe more complicated or interactive or whatever. Um, so it's definitely, everything we've done has been sort of a, a stair step up of where we're going to and what we're trying to achieve. Yeah, I'd say it's kind of like more like a, a path of evolution 
as it were, well, where it's all trial and error based uh, all the way through where you start to build up requirements and needs, you know, to be able to produce better, <clears throat> better workflows and better productions for your customers. I just wanted to also, uh, again, welcome everybody here. Part, thanks for being part of the conversation. We do try to keep this very interactive. So as we're kind of going through the conversation, if you guys have a question, please feel free to post anything you want in the comments and we'll gladly engage you guys live in real time. It's part of the reason why we do these live. So um, feel free to, to basically ask us anything, comment on anything. Uh, we'd love to have that feedback. So Corey, kind of going through um, the process and the workflows of creating and producing these different shows within a virtual environment and, and an extended reality environments, what would you say have been some of like the, the biggest moments and of, of your transition or the, the, the I wouldn't want to call them, well, I guess we could really kind of, I hate to use the term challenges, but you know, some of the, some of the points of transition that you've kind of had a, an interesting time through the course of transitioning or, or learning those different little nuances in, in the sure. conversion into virtual production. I, I think, I mean, for me anyway, using our knowledge of traditional shows and traditional workflows and timelines was a great start, but it, it is really the, the huge difference I found with this is um, it, the, the, when you when you build a show, you're anticipating all the issues that are going to come up. You're anticipating how long you think it's going to rehearse, how long you think it's going to take to build a scenic piece, how long the content's going to take to make to get it to be correct on a certain point in time, which is usually the show. Well, what happens, I think, what I've learned from this, doing it virtually, is so much more of that has to be done. Um, like the anticipation is so much more relevant because you there's so many more things to think about that aren't real. That's like it's the, the the you know the system is one piece, the virtual content is another piece. The thing and and getting all that to be predictive of when you'll be ready to actually film it. Um, you know, it's just a, it's a lot more in depth. I found uh, it's kind of like <laughs> yeah, to me, you like can't really just wing it, right? You can't like hit a button and be like, "So, oh, well, that was a mess up." Like I totally screwed up there, but nobody really noticed. Carry on. Yeah, it, it'll be fine. I mean, it's it's you know very much in a traditional sort of two D content workflow. You're you're changing stuff up until the show, and then it's the show, and and you made the content. Well, all of those changes are now like three dimensional. So like they have the potential for problems or successes on a much greater rate and take much more time to create. So changing things uh, during the rehearsal, during the last minute times when you would normally be able to say, well, let's just go back and you know fix it in the edit. It's like, that's not really possible. Like we have to get yeah, it's the live, shots right? we need it's and it's, it's, it's live and it's, it's built in a 3D world. So if you build a, a thing that's obstructing your view from this shot, that's the thing. It's like a fake, it's like a virtual piece of scenery. You have to get rid of it. And then taking that out or moving it in the scene or scaling it or whatever you're going to do could potentially affect all the other things you've done in that same scene. So knowing that now, you sort of I work a lot more backwards of saying what are our kind of timelines, what are our you know deliverable dates, what are we what are we validating things, how much time do we really need to rehearse each virtual scene, and like those conversations are much harder to have. A month out or two months out, when it all sounds like a great idea, and you sort of have to focus people and say, "I've had to focus people and say, listen, like you really need to think about this as like a a, 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 a world, a scenery, whatever you want to call, it, whatever you're used to doing. Like you would want to rehearse this normally for two or three hours for a thing. I, I think we're going to take four or five hours just to do this one section, if not longer, depending on how detailed you want to get. So you then have to multiply that out over all the things you want to do." And say this one event you want to do is going to take ten to fourteen days to like rehearse, just like a tour. If you were going to set up a, a tour or a Broadway show, you'd have a sort of predictable uh, rehearsal period of time to get it all right and, and try things, experiment with things, get your camera shots right, get your lighting right, do all the things you want to do. But that happens now, you know, in a much more condensed timeline and a much much uh, more restrictive space. So it's it's it really is a more, more delicate balance of trying to combine 
sort of what I think of as like a sort of theater workflow with sort of a music video mentality with a you know music tour experience. Um, even even if you're not, even if it's more of a corporate environment or even a commercial type shoot or a live television event, like you just have to think about it in, this, in these different ways of, you can't just load in the scenery, load in your host and shoot it and hope for the best. Uh, you really have to sort of map it out, camera block it and all kinds of things um, to kind of get the looks to be correct. Um, yeah, Jake's got a good question there. How interactive with the performer do you believe the tech will get? Um, I mean, I think it can be pretty interactive. We, we've, we've pushed some boundaries um, on the stuff we've done to see motion tracking and, you know, experimenting with, you know, Stipe follower and different black tracks configurations. Like, I think you can get it to be real time. I mean, that's the, the whole idea is that it's all running at 60 frames a second. If you can get all that to be talking to each other, it's, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be interactive. My whole question is the, the creativity. You know, what it's, it's been my question on, on live events for 15 years since video tried to sort of you know get in there, um, or probably longer, I guess. But like, what makes it interactive versus pre choreographed? That's the real creative question to me. Of like, what we can get it to work in real time, where we can follow something around or follow a person. But what is that doing? Is it generating something? Is it interacting with different objects that are also in 3D space? Is it you know the the big uh, goal of using occlusion and having things hidden and coming around and having different objects come in front and behind of people. Like all that stuff is technically possible, but what is it really doing to the show to be, uh, to prove that it's interactive versus either pre-built or pre-taped or pre-choreographed? And then how does it help tell the story of what's going on? Um, yeah, I was just about to say, I think a lot of it goes back to the old telltale of storyboarding and having a really good story to tell throughout the experience and then creating those moments around that story or around that vision that's going to be portrayed. Sure. I mean, I, I think one of the, one of the words I use to people all the time is, uh, is storyboarding because that's kind of what you have to think of it as a creative or as a director. It's not so much building a set and then, you know, rehearsing in it. It is what is what is going to be, how are we going to get from, from point A to point B or from scene to scene. Uh, and I think some of the ones I've seen have been super successful um, in doing that because it's just, it's it's the directorial mentality I think that comes from a, a, a very strong creative and then works down the line. And once you start to wrap your head around the limitations, the possibilities and, and what can be done within the space, it really becomes clear like, like any other show, how to do the, how to do the next one better versus what was the failure of that show? It's like, well, we made it all work, but this will make it work a lot easier and allow us to do a lot more things creatively. So that's kind of what we're approaching it from. Of what, what do we think the next steps are, and 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 who wants to take those? You know, who wants to sort of push this to the next limit um, and be and use that interactivity? And what is it? What is it doing to their story? Is it a musical thing? Is it a you know game show thing? Is it actually something you're doing physically that's gonna that's gonna trigger an object? That's gonna, you know, are you playing, uh, you know, a Wheel of Fortune, you know, with a, all virtual, you know, pieces, and then you just you're touching the air and it's actually doing stuff. Yeah, like there, there, there is a whole world of things where that that can happen. Um, and this, oh, this is the technology. Wheel of Fortune, now. You got me on a Wheel of Fortune. I want to play Wheel of Fortune in a virtual environment. I mean, why not? <laughs> I'm gonna hop on a plane and I'm coming to you. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> So this brings up actually a really interesting point, and that's talent and dealing with talent kind of in these virtual environments. You know, it, going from something that's a physical that people have been used to, especially performers working on physical sets with physical props and physical elements. You know, now you're coming into a complete environment where you, as you mentioned before, you've got occlusion, you've got augment, basically an augmented reality overlay on the front plane. Um, how how have the performers actually been reacting to working inside of these new environments and these virtual environments? Have there been some that have been better than others? Uh, you know, is there a lot of, do you guys use anything to depict that they're actually holding on to a prop of some sort? Or, you know, how is that approached and how does the, uh, the talent feel about it, about working I, in the virtual environments? I think, I think with everything this year, it's been, a, a little bit of a mystery and a lot of confusion on the front end. So trying to explain stuff to people six months ago 
was a lot more complicated than it is now because now we have a lot more examples of, of our work and other people's work to say, well, look at this. Did, did, did you, like, do, you like, do you like this or do you understand how this works? And then you kind of walk them through the process, but without, without real examples other than sort of test cases, it was very difficult to sort of explain what was about to happen. I think when people, at least that we've worked with, you know, get on stage and get either get in the room, they kind of understand it 90% more than they did before they walked in the room. And when they get on stage and see stuff happening and they can see where they're standing and they can see what's happening and they can then sort of watch a preview monitor and say, oh, this is where the thing is. And I can turn around and I can actually see the thing. Um, it, it pretty much clicks in the rest of the 10%. Like it's very fast. People have been using LED screens and video content and you know, even interactive stuff for a long time as, as far as performers and people who do you know, on stage stuff. Um, but when you can actually see it with your eyes, I think it makes a ton more sense to, to be able to move around, you know, to stand, stand on this little platform thing and you'll be on the platform. Oh, I, I can, that makes sense to me. And when the cameras cut around it, it changes, but the, you know, because it's anchored in 3D space, you don't have to move. It's actually, it's based around where you are. So as long as everything is built sort of the direct, correct way and, and scale and based on, you know, templates and whatever has been decided, then everything sort of fits together and the human sees the thing and understands it pretty, pretty quickly. Um, and then I think as you get into the more reactive and interactive things, um, that just becomes a, a bit of a standard rehearsal prop idea of, of when I do this, this thing happens. Or when I hold this object, it becomes a lightsaber or whatever. And then that's, that's your, you know, mentality. Uh, what, what I will say in any show, more so even in this scenario, is, you know, it's great to have monitors to sort of see what you're doing you know, a teleprompter and or additionally the actual preview of what you know, you're know you doing. Everyone uh, I've worked with ever in my life, including people in XR, once those are on, we'll just look at that the whole time. So it's good to have that as a preview so people can understand, oh, I, when I, I'm, I can see what I'm doing. I can't walk this far. I can't walk this far. This is what's going to happen. And then you turn those off and you film it because if they film it while they're looking at it, all they're doing is trying to like watch themselves <laughs> kind of move around. Um, and that's... We're, we're all suckers for that, aren't we? Yeah. But when they, when they start looking to the environment, you, you just feel like you know where you are. So it's, it's definitely, uh, I think, a, a great learning tool. Um, oh, hi. Um, it's a great learning tool, and it's a great, it's, it becomes demystified, I think, the minute you, you step on stage, because it just becomes very, very natural to where you're supposed to be. Yeah, and that's understandable. I mean, it's it's kind of uh, an idea of habit, creating that habit, uh, and getting used to it. It's just like just about anything else. I know, I know, I've definitely had my challenges in just doing this every single week and trying to figure out. You know, there's a lot of things that just feel very unnatural to me. <laughs> At least when I started, and even today, I'm a little more offset than normal, and I'm like, oh, this doesn't feel right. I, I don't really feel like this is the right way to go. But you know, five minutes in, I'm like, oh yeah, okay, this this works. This works. This works okay. Yeah, it's, it's, it's been interesting even working with sort of the crews and camera guys and the various people we've, we've interacted with. I think a lot of them have the same feeling of, well, this is just this is just a different thing. And you sort of get 20 minutes into rehearsal and you're like, oh no, it's just a show. Like we've done shows forever. It's, it's just using a new, like I said in the beginning, it's just using a new tool that, you know, makes everything make sense again of how do you light for it? Well, the lighting is a little different. It's very important, but lighting's always been very important. So now you just have to pay a little more attention to being in the constraints of this literal box. So how does that work? Well, once you've done it, it makes more sense. Um, being on stage with a virtual scene, once you sit up there, you sort of understand it better. And then when you're running a camera where you're seeing the live cut and the preview of the extension, all that kind of things, like it's a little more confusing at first, but eventually it's just like, oh, this is just a regular camera. You know, it's it's that you everything works the way it is. And, and we are sort of enjoying this workflow because it outputs um, whatever the media is in a format that people can understand. So it's something you can watch on TV or on your phone or on a computer. Like it's, there's no reinvention of having to wear a headset or, you know, trying to find some new streaming platform that does volumetric capture. Like that, that'll that come, all that stuff is gonna happen. It's just, this is a medium where you can film a new, film a show, a new interactive experience with a performer or business person or corporate, you know, tycoon, whatever and then give it to the people to watch it and they understand that. So like we're just sort of replacing 
what would be, I think, a traditional venue with people and an audience with something that you can now do a lot more with, but still appreciate in the same sort of format. Yeah, it's interesting because it really becomes a thing of adoption again, and we've really adopted really well to flipping onto our phones and you know cruising through different streams and you know YouTube has basically become a, a normal media uh, medium to be able to to view these different things. So it's kind of that natural you know kind of a natural progression, I would think for us where when you get into uh, other environments like working in virtual reality, you know, it still doesn't feel normal and you can only be in there for a limited amount of time before your brain starts to like process. No. That. It's, <laughs> it's, it's in a place that it shouldn't be, you know? Uh, Christy was asking here, it seems like the audience was engaged and immersed in the Billie Irish, Eilish experience this past Saturday, what things do you incorporate differently for audience engagement and participation? Which I think is a really interesting actual, really interesting question. Totally, and, uh, and I think that it, it, it really does depend, and it um, there's a whole set of technical things we can chat about quickly, but there's really what is the what is the intent? And I know I've seen a bunch of different ways to do the, what I call the Zoom audience, which is probably not the right term, but the, <laughs> the, sort, of, the sort of, you know, the interactive word, word now. Yeah, <laughs> well, you know, type it. It's, a, it's, I mean, it, it sort of is what it is. You're, take, you're taking a sort of person at home and piping them into either an audience for the performer to see or for the audience to see themselves or, you know, what is that interactivity? How, like, the real timeness of it is a huge technical question because you're, you know, you need to get link the live show with someone at home who's watching it and, and reporting back in to be part of the live show. So technically there's a huge like loop of information that has to be going back and forth, which is feasible and, and, and it's been done over many of the shows. We had a, a live component in the VMAs as well. So that was, you know, a whole layer of things that had to get, you know, pre-thought out as far as who are those people, you know, are they when are they going to be watching? Uh, you know, we have to schedule all the things to have the audience be live. Uh, if it's going to be pre taped it's going to be live live. We obviously have to schedule those people to be available at the time of the show. Uh, and then, you know, what happens. Um, so I think it's, it's definitely a question. I mean, it's, again, what is the artistic intent? What is the creative notion? Is it very important for the person to feel that the audience is there interacting with them? Do they want to ask them questions? Do they want to be able to, do some sort of fan meet and greet that's exclusive to just those people. Um, but I think it does, there are a lot of people that value that. And I think that seeing you know, themselves as part of the show or as their friends as part of the show or whatever their, you know, whatever the case is, I think it definitely um, helps the artist connect with what they're doing. Uh, it can be very daunting for some artists to perform to a sort of empty room, you know, and, and we, I sort of sometimes forget that because we experience that a lot on our end as like going to a rehearsal where you're in an arena yeah, playing exactly. your, your in audience the arena. five people. Yeah. Um, and we're like, we're used to that. A lot of performers who are veterans are used to that because it's just the rehearsal. You, you're, you're kind of giving it 60%, but you're, you're, you're getting it through and you're trying stuff out. Um, some people are, are, are better at that than others or, or enjoy it more than others. But like, it's very hard to like be full out to an audience of, however many people are watching, you just can't see. So that, that I think is a huge, uh, a huge benefit um, to, to certainly the performers as well as I think the audience members who get to be a part of it. So I think, I think we'll see a bunch of different ways. I mean, I've seen a bunch of ways, but I think we'll continue to see a bunch of ways tried of, of involving people in what are traditionally audience positions. But it just, to me, it's such a foreign, it, we, haven't, I can't, we haven't quite hit it hundred percent. I don't, everything is going to depend on the artist. I don't know. I'm rambling, but it's, it's very hard to sort of see how you, how the artist wants to have the audience involved and how the audience appreciates being involved. But I think it all depends on a, on a, you know, music and artist level, like on, on the dynamic between the audience, their fans and themselves. Um, and some people will want a more interactive and, and less, but it's, it'll be interesting to see the way people try, I guess. The other, the other part that really interests me is, is what what lays ahead. I, I, I personally feel like where we are currently is the tip of the iceberg. 
There's a lot of workflows that are being worked out. There's a lot of technologies that are being worked out. There's a lot of technologies that are coming into play that are going to replace other ones that already exist. You know, computer vision and LiDAR, I mean, LiDAR coming out on the iPhones is crazy. Uh, what's going to be able to be done with that <laughs> is going to be absolutely nuts. You know, it's going to bring a lot of things to the different, to, to the next level. Um, and a lot of these technologies are still being built. You know, there, there's a lot of people out there that are experimenting, creating, um, you know, putting in networks and, and bandwidths to be able to handle and manage people being able to be virtually present in an environment. Uh, so I'm, I'm still very excited to see, but it, it's interesting as to where we are, uh, especially with you guys, you know, kind of helping pioneer and pave, pave the way in creating these workflows now for the benefits of many, many others to come in the future. So it's, yeah, I, I, yeah, I, th I think, I mean, that what we've been joking about for six months is that this is all sort of the wild west and, and not only in the, in the, you know, nothing is incorrect because we're trying it all to be different ways, just like the audience thing. Like it's not, there's a right or wrong way to do anything. It's what do you, what works for this particular thing and using these new technologies, like hopefully, Every, like I said, with the stair stepping thing, like every time we achieve something, we kind of standardize it, and that becomes a workable platform for you know other people to use, as well as just to to step on and above, because that's what you want to be doing. Is well, this now works. This is now like a format and a medium and a, and a workflow. Uh, and now, how do we do the next thing? And how do we use this to step above? And without having to now rethink how all this is plugged in together, we now just kind of know that this is how we do it, and and that's you know that's. That has happened with every industry, in the, at least in my you know experience in the entertainment business. Like every time a new technology is released, it's kind of immediately you know adopted in in as much as it can be, and then it, because it becomes sort of more standard, it becomes more of just a, another workflow that that people use or another tool in the toolkit. So I mean, our our goal is you know, and I've had this conversation every day for weeks, but like. I don't think anyone believes this is going to replace live shows or audience shows no. or traditional shows or music venues or comedy shows or anything like that. It's more of a and then a tool to be able to you know, work for now, push creativity in a different way because a lot of the things you can do either in a pre-taped or a live XR show, you just can't do in your life. Um, and then I think it'll also push that technology into real live shows, touring shows, where we want to have more AR and interactive environments. We want to have, you know, I mean, everybody wants holograms, right? That's that's no secret ever since Star Wars. Um, so like, how do you get those things into the into the real world as opposed to the video? But now we know how to, now we can do it here and experiment with it. And that's going to build a lot of technology, you know, coming out of this. So like, I think, yeah, having LiDAR scanners on your phone is going to make you know, the, the concert experience in two or three years when everyone holds up their phone to see what the AR elements are, well, now their phone might be able to know exactly what's around them, who's around them, how deep it is, how far they are from the stage. Like, you can suddenly add all those data points into something that right now is just sort of like a QR code. But now in the future, that could be something super, super, you know, much more interactive and much more uh, usable, I think. Yeah, so it's just going to hopefully keep building and building on itself. <laughs> the future is going to be the oasis. We're all going to jack into our virtual environments and live our life in a virtual setting. It certainly feels that way, yeah. Well, we're definitely adding more to it. I, I was going to actually just comment on Jake's Jake's last remark uh, about the extent. Like, I think it's an extension. I think it's always going to be an extension. and. A lot of uh, people that I've spoken to in the past six months that have been working inside of virtual production have all come back with really positive outcomes that this allows a lot of people that can't traditionally attend an event or might not have the money to be able to go to an event or might have you know, a, a physical problem where they can't attend the event. This opens up just a huge amount of outreach for these events to basically work and thrive and live in a hybrid environment where you've got both the live piece on stage and uh, a, an extension or an extended reality of that uh, happening live at the same time. 
And I guess that actually comes around to be a really interesting question for you, Corey, is what are your thoughts and views on um, producing that kind of event moving forward? You know, as we work our way back into live events and bringing people back on site, being able to produce a, both a live event and a virtual streaming event at the same time simultaneously. Um, I, I mean, I think I think that's definitely it is. It's how it's going to happen, right? Exactly, exactly as you described. It's going to start to hybridize from either everything that's been happening virtually, and people start adding audiences back in, or they pick an event that they want to try to hold that has a full or lower capacity audience that we then want to do a virtual stream on top of and, and combine those worlds from whatever you know promoter decides to try it first. Um, but I think like a lot of this stuff has somewhat existed. Um, you know, I'm just going to use my own experience of working with several artists at Coachella over the last like seven or eight years. Mm -hmm. Like you, you use, you know, you, we build the show for Coachella, but the stream has become so important. So what you're really, you know, especially with like the Gambino show and, and the Beyonce show that ended up becoming a Netflix show, like what you're so focused on the camera shots and the stream and the story you're telling with that environment, because you're now like quadrupling or you know exponentially adding people who are watching it that way who can't come to the show or don't live around there or don't want to pay for it or whatever. And now you're um, now you're taking that audience of however many hundred thousand into millions uh, and then per in perpetuity for people who watch it forever. So like I think over the last ten years and, and more, it's becoming more and more and more important for people to sort of see that as an as a as another audience member of the show and how important the camera is um and basically you know lighting everything as though it's an instagram post or a tv show or a youtube stream because ultimately it has been since you know 2010 or before because anything you've anything i've done has ended up on somebody's phone from some show somewhere and sometimes it looks terrible because you don't think that way you think about how does it look in front of house or how does it look on camera maybe for the imac and now it's like no like this Cut, yeah. cut, 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 cut. Yeah. This has to be, this has to be like every shot has to be, you know, really good. I mean, I've, I, I've worked for certain artists who will literally text me or send me Instagram posts and be like, why does this look bad? And like, well, because they're in like the eighth, eighth row away at the top. And I don't know, like, I don't, I didn't go look at that seat. Um, but that's, that's the mentality. Like, this is my, this is, this is how people, who aren't at the show to see the show, it has to look great. And I think that's all merging into this new thing um, where now that everything is basically a live stream or a camera shot, like you're watching it on a screen somewhere, you're very rarely going to be walking into a venue for the next you know, foreseeable future. So you know, that, that has refocused everyone's attention that way. But I think to answer the question, it'll be merging back the other way as well. So you'll have to, there's no such thing as like, you might need you might need two people, but it's the, the one show, and it's perceived in a stream camera, whether that's AR, VR, whatever, or not VR, but AR or XR or whatever, and then the live stuff for the people in the room. And you want to give them both the experience. And I think that's the technology will start to merge. Is how, merge is how do you actually reproduce those effects for the people in the room that aren't just watching it on the IMAX screen, but want to see some new sort of you know foodie immersive technology and not on their phone. I mean, we're, we're very limited in the fact that we're humans and not machines, but they, they, you can, we'll have to find some ways of like tying a lot of this stuff together. And I think that's what's, that's what can be really interesting as we get back into like live live shows. I was going to say, I think that's, um, that's definitely something that is going to push into the years ahead is the convergence of live streaming, live production, and even moving, uh, you know, say a few years ahead, where wearables are starting to become are, are starting to become more of a thing, and you, you we're going to start to see a lot more people wearing glasses, um, not for prescription sake, but from an augmented reality point of view and an informative point of view. You know, it's going to be interesting to also see the workflows and the production workflows and working in producing event where you've got a bunch of people wearing glasses. Right, and you're feeding information into those lenses while they're watching live, and being able to filter things on, filter things off. You know, might even get to the point where you'd, they'd be able to filter privacy filters on their glasses, where they can switch back and forth between a live environment and being in a virtual environment at the same time, which is oh sure, 
I mean, we we I had been working on a project earlier in the year about um, that was a live live show that was trying to incorporate, um, you know, like uh, Google Glass Magic Leap style um, Hubble lens, yeah, you know, well, objects so that you can have three D objects, and that's I mean, it works. It it works right now, and it, that that whole technology spectrum, I think, is 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 hopefully still working in the background for. All the reasons it should, but also knowing that, well, when we come back, we're going to expect to see floating holograms in space. Um, maybe not Google Glass. I don't remember. It, was it, one it never left, Jake. It never left, man. It's on your, <laughs> it's on your phone now. You can go and like have lions and stuff in your house. But I, th I think that's going to be a huge thing. And how does that interact with real time lighting? And how does it diminish your capacity to see peripheral objects? And how does it, you know, cut down on the brightness of the stage from a 40 foot view or 80 foot view or hundred foot view. Like th there's a lot of things that I think hopefully are still getting worked out in the background, but it's those technologies I think are going to start to become part of uh, daily life. And if, again, it, yeah, it becomes, you know, if I can just put on my own glasses and, uh, and, and use them instead of a big giant headset, that's, you know, a couple of years away. But I think that that's definitely going to give us those elements in, uh, in the world. Uh, reality sucks. These are much better. Yeah, yeah. No, I prefer. <laughs> I'm already in 2021. It's much, much better looking through these yeah. ones. He's here. Yeah, I'm just gonna go like this. <laughs> so, Corey, I, I wanted to also ask before we wrap up. Uh, you know, for the people that are watching the show that are kind of first starting out or getting their feet wet. Uh, I know there's a lot. There's been a lot of transition. I've had some people reaching out to me that are in the course of transitioning. You know, from a, a different area within our industry. You know, maybe from doing lighting or audio or working. You know, as a front of house engineer, and they're starting to explore into virtual production. What would be some of the the best pieces of wisdom and advice you might be able to give those to? I guess um, <laughs> right, they're huge. <laughs> to those I mean, are. good good luck. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I think I think like I said, like it, uh, ultimately. You, you get to a point where it sort of it it does feel like a traditional show. So there isn't a huge gap into doing something in a virtual production, whatever that is. I think the fact that virtual production currently can pretty much mean anything. So it's it's there's still a big ambiguity around what like what is this show you're talking about doing, or, or what are the, what are the needs in this workflow? I think things like. Guys, understanding Skype, understanding uh, Moses, any kind of like tracking system or technology, how they all talk together is a huge advantage. Like just being familiar with those systems and knowing the protocols and how they talk to each other, how how to calibrate them, how to fix them, how to install them. Like that's a huge um, piece of like technology that's not going to go away. So like getting involved in anything like that is super helpful. Um, you know the unreal and and and, and not side of things are, are not going away either. They are super great tools for you know doing renders, building scenery, building XR environments, uh, building just content in general. So like using using those tools will never not be useful, and they may just lead you to whatever comes next if if that's the case. But I think that they're not going away for a while, um, and they're certainly being expanded upon to get more and more um, focused on. You know the entertainment industry is in one way, but also just like time. So building stuff and and thinking about it in a workflow of I need this. You know the show's on Friday. What can I do if I start Monday? There's a lot that can be figured out in that timeline, but it's getting a lot faster where things are just you know more robust. They've fixed a lot of problems. They've found a lot of problems. They've found a lot of work you know workarounds. So things to kind of get just to get a knowledge base that. Speed is always everything and when it comes to live production. Just small well, speed and accuracy are my two favorite things. But getting things done quickly and correctly. Um, so the faster you can do that in any of those pieces of software, the more valuable it is. And the, and the faster you can do those in multiple pieces of software, the, the more valuable that gets. So the, it's just it's more about you know uh, thinking about it from sort of a Broadway perspective. You know, the more you know about all the departments, the more you're going to be able to work. You know, in that space, because more so than ever before, all these things are talking to each other, literally, from the performer to the camera to the wall to the Skype to the content to the audio. Everything is talking to each other. 
So, you know, everything needs to sort of work in harmony and also be able to know enough about each other to sort of spot problems or spot advantages to say, well, if we did it this way, we would actually speed everything up. Or, you know, you're building your content wrong. You should just change these things or do this thing differently or whatever. Um, and all those all those ways of communicating, I think, are, are going to get things going. And, and I don't think it's ever everyone, anyone should be afraid to think they're not doing it right or don't know what they're doing. Th this is sort of again the wild west where it, it, there isn't a right or wrong way. There's just the way you find that works for you and the way that ultimately gets the show created. So um, I think this is a great time for people to try things and, and learn new things and try to combine new things. Yeah, it's it's figuring out the tricks of the trade. Uh, if I was going to put a little nugget of advice in there too, just from my own personal side, I would say also try and key in and focus on what you really enjoy doing um, as part of the workflow and focus on that. Focus on it's good to ha def definitely have the broad knowledge of how everything works because you kind of need to know how everything works in general um, or at least have an understanding of how the bits and pieces all go together. But if there's one thing in particular that you really enjoy, Keep your focus and your your hone in on on that one particular thing because that's going to help you become much more proficient. It's going to help you gain more knowledge, of course, on that on that particular part of the workflow, and it's going to make you essentially invaluable to helping out uh, companies and helping out studios. You know, um, kind of expedite and and help uh, make those those features and those effects more proficient and workflows more proficient moving forward. So that would be my, sure. own, I mean, my own little you got, it, you got to enjoy it. If you don't enjoy it, it's not the point. So that's if you don't enjoy uh, it, get out. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and, and you'll find, I think, quickly which parts you do enjoy better and which points it would gravitate towards. And it really does, I think, I don't know, maybe my experience, you, you, don't, you don't stay doing what you don't like for very long. So it's... Uh, it's good to learn all the things, but then it helps. It also, like you said, helps narrow in on which ones you like and which ones you want to focus on. So there you go. As Jake said, love what you do, and it will love you back. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> well, Corey, I just want to thank you so much for your time today. It's been an absolute great conversation, and I have thoroughly enjoyed having you here with me today. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure, and we'll uh, hopefully uh, do more soon. Absolutely. And again, thank you guys. Thanks to everybody viewing today. It's been just wonderful having you, Jake. Thanks for all of your input. And Christy, thank you, thank you so much for, for helping push things forward. So I just want to let you all know that next week, uh, the guest on the show is actually yours truly. It's me. Uh, I've never really done an, uh, a show myself, and my wonderful wife is going to be interviewing me. So if you guys have any questions that you'd like for me, myself, uh, and I... <laughs> <laughs> please feel free to post them in the comments or throughout social media over the course of the next uh, the next week, and I will gladly get around to them next week. And um, we've also got, as I mentioned earlier on, we've kind of started this, this new little thing where we've got a swag shop for ahead of the curve stuff to help kind of support, comp or support this, support the effort here, and uh, also uh, a Patreon page as well. But uh, just wanted to thank everybody, and as I say every single week, stay ahead of the curve. Thanks, Corey. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Thanks, everybody.